actually happens. Uh, and then on the right, uh, you may recognize this is the Bodies Galaxies, uh, M81 and M82. Uh, that is RGB, and it does have a H-alpha sort of plug in there. If you notice uh, at the bottom of this image, there is a fairly bright uh, red band there that I was able to pull out with a little uh, extra help. I think, Paul, your commentary about 100 plus hours of YouTube videos on Pix Insight is it has been the bane of my existence. Uh, I wish there was a more efficient way. Uh, mm. But nevertheless, I've been using Pix Insight as one of the processing tools for this um, with, you know, mixed results as we go. Um, and I don't know if you have a video up that comes up next, Paul. It may. Oh, oh yeah. So this one. just for those of you that have never thought about remote imaging, it's becoming more and more common. Prices are, well, let's say they're expensive, but they've been coming down. Um, in green is the little Tech 140 I have there, but you can just see a very broad range of telescopes in, in essentially a garage. Um, every night, the the roof rolls off. Everybody's open to the skies all night. Uh, I've discovered that just physically manning a computer and operating a telescope all night has just been nearly impossible. So there is some really sophisticated and neat automation software. And for my telescope, I'm able to, you know, I've probably got about six months of targets in there. And I just kind of monitor and observe and just check that everything's going well. And what else do we have here, Paul? All right. So then I got your, this one I did get a video here. So, okay. So this is a video of uh, solar observing. I have a, um, a Lunt telescope that I operate in my backyard. I have a little outhouse observatory. And I've discovered that it is fascinating to do time lapse photography because the sort of scale at which things change on the sun is in the order of hours and when you're imaging you just can't see it so this was a pretty exciting uh sort of evolution for me to get into something new and exciting and that's it paul thank you yeah these are fantastic i love the solar work especially um and uh you know, there we do have other members that are do remote observing. Um, Linda Thomas Fowler is one of them. Uh, you could probably uh, hook up with them if you wanted to collaborate any or get some get some of their thoughts too, uh, Ian. So a lot of resources. There's also an imaging group that meets uh, um, not quite monthly, but that's where they deep dive into processing um, techniques and things too. So a lot of resources available to folks. Uh, now I got to figure out how to get the video out. Let's see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So then this is another great lead in to the loaner program. I'm really plugging the loaner scope program because uh, not only do we have great equipment there that can be checked out uh, for members, but we have solar equipment. We have this, this two of these quark eyepieces, which allow you to see the prominences like Ian is showing. And you can check those out. We have uh, astro cameras that allow you to take the video like Ian is showing. Um, so if you can bring your own refractor to the party, you can do some some cool stuff like, like Ian did. Uh, but there's a whole range of other things that uh, you can get started with, just like, uh, you know, that's the way Gowrie, like I mentioned, that's the way she got started. Um, and nobody's gonna catch her now. She's so far, so far out on the curve there, so. Um, this is a great way for members to really uh, plug into uh, capabilities and, and, and I'll say benefits of being a member here. So just go to the members page or portal on novac.com uh, and you'll find the loaner scope and you can uh, discover what's available. Uh, and then I think maybe my last, I'm not quite sure, but Aaron uh, Lubin sent this in. Um, what I like about this one is just the clarity in the, in the trapezium area here of M42. You know, a lot of times it's really blown out. I think he did a great job of capturing this. Uh, so Aaron, are you on? Um, yep, sure am, Paul. Yeah. Cool. Cool, thanks, and yeah, uh, thanks for everyone for sharing it. Yeah, yeah, so this is really cool. I took this um, out in West Virginia on a cold November night, um, actually at the Experience Learning Center. 
Um, and I have a Star Tracker um, Skywatcher Pro um, set up that I got this year. Um, I use a plain A7R3 with a um, 400 millimeter lens and sat out there for a couple of hours to get um, the focus as best as I could and um, tracked it for about an hour and stacked the images in, uh, in Affinity because they have a new astrophotography setting that I've been using. So and it, it seems to work really well. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, I love it because you got nice color, but you've got also the dark, uh, you know, dust here that's well, well defined. I think it's fantastic. Uh, so thanks. Yeah, to I've been trying to take that for a couple of years and that's the best <laughs> one I've got. So and, and, and like everyone else here, a lot of YouTube videos. Yeah. Yeah. I'm staying away from this target because I know it's a monster to process and, and get looking nice. But uh, really, really nice work, Aaron. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for sending those in. That's a really great uh, piece of uh, showing, showcasing what our what our members can do. Uh, here's what we got coming up. So I neglected to talk about Arlington Planetarium, and my my bad for that when I sent the email out. But this Friday we have an opportunity to go down there and show some uh, planets and uh, whatever whatever else we can find with some telescopes out on the on the front steps there. So they would love to have us there. I think we have a couple of folks signed up, but we can certainly use more. Uh, six to nine o'clock on Friday should be clear. I think, you know, as, as good as a forecast is this far out, it, it looks like it's clear. Um, so let us know, shoot an email to outreach at novak.com if you can help with that one. Um, and then of course we've got Crockett Public Night and Udvar Hazi. Uh, so nice, nice packed weekend, uh, coming up. Um, and, and we did have Sky Meadows. I neglected to talk about that. I know some folks went out on Friday night, uh, and Saturday as well. So, uh, um, those were, those were, those were good events on, uh, good opportunities for everyone. Uh, all right. So thank you for that. And a little plug for next month as we get into 2024. Um, we're going to have Dr. Kate Russo and she will be our speaker. Uh, and she's a notable author, uh, about, uh, eclipses. And, uh, Dan, if you want to give us a little plug here, you can, but, uh, uh, you met up with her down in Texas uh, for the annular, and we made an invite, and she accepted. So uh, she'll be our speaker in January. Uh, it's going to be uh, virtual. She lives in, I think it's Queensland, you said. Is that right, Dan? Uh, out, out, it's uh, Queensland, yeah. It's a little north uh, between Farns and uh, Brisbane. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I've uh, followed Kate for about seven years. Uh, she's, she's written several books on uh, total eclipses. She's a psychologist, and she's, uh, she first started studying them because it's one of the few human experiences with, with predictable awe. When people see a total solar eclipse, you know, they get awe. Sorry. And she's doing all this work on, you know, putting electrodes on brains and seeing how people respond to it and all. So she looks at it, you know, instead of talking about a syzygy alignment of the earth, moon, sun, she's really talking about what happens to people in groups and individually when they see eclipses and all. It's fascinating work. So I think yeah. people will enjoy it. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun too. So yeah, very different take on it. And I think we'll give away a couple of her books. So we'll kick off the new year uh, in uh, pretty good fashion here, but it is, uh, it is basically the first. It's the second sun, uh, Sunday, like it, like we always do, but uh, it comes pretty early in in January. So mark your calendars for that, and that'll be great. And uh, any questions from anybody uh, about the club or where we're headed or or uh, status? We can certainly use your help uh, uh, going into the next weekend, and then we kind of have a soft landing here for the holidays and. Uh, you all got your eggnog, right? You did as I was asking you to do, right? So, hey, Paul. Uh, yes, sir. Could I take just a second before we go sure. into break? Yeah. I know you're coming to the end of your term as president here this month. And I just wanted, while we had the maximum number of people online here, to thank you for your service, particularly going, taking us through the pandemic and helping the club go virtual, which I believe probably allows many, many more members of the club to attend the monthly meetings so thanks so much for your time as president paul yeah sure thank, thanks david i appreciate it it's uh it's uh it's work but it's fun work and and it's satisfying and it's uh tr tremendous people so uh that makes it easy and uh and uh, thank thanks dave i appreciate it um, dave uh, uh paul i want to 
uh, add on to that. Um, we've got a, I don't know if you can see it. We've got an engraved laser pointer for you. Oh, nice. You can be a bad actor on the, on the observing <laughs> field. The, I'll get uh, kicked off the, <laughs> I'll get kicked out of the field when I. Just don't use it to do hazy. You'll be fine. I don't, yeah, I don't know if it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it reads correctly, but uh, uh, thank you so much, President. Alan. Twenty twenty three, uh, twenty twenty one to twenty three. Yeah. Thank you, man. Paul Severance. Thank you so much, Alan. Yeah, I appreciate it. what Dave said is true. You you put up with a lot, even beyond putting up with me uh, for three <laughs> years. Um, no, it's, uh, but you you took on a lot yourself because you you felt like you had to, and whenever something needed to be done, Paul took it on, and he really set. Uh, a high threshold for uh, for the officers who are going to come follow them next year. And they're good people too, but uh, they're going to have to work hard to to keep up to your standard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people may not have realized one of the things he went through was uh, making sure we had a place to meet, even though we're not using it tonight. That was a big hurdle too during his uh, presidency. So yeah. thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Alan. And uh, you know. Um, we do have some turnover. Alan's leaving too, and and he's got even more time in the club than than a lot of folks. You know, he's kind of our he's kind of our rock and and truth truth teller for for science and for for all manner of other things. Uh, I've leaned on leaned on Alan for a lot uh, over the past three years, uh, and uh, you know, you guys have you guys bring so much to the table um, that it's it's impressive and humbling to to kind of, you know, work with, work with all of you, different, different, different walks of life, different experiences. Um, uh, but every one of you is like a su superstar. So, um, you know, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Dave and Alan, I appreciate it. And every, everyone that chimed in, I think Google must have uh, enabled new, new emojis or something. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, I, I thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, so we're, we're we're a little bit behind, and I know our speaker's online. So I, I wanna I wanna move right on forward, um, and I'll do a short intro, and you can grab some, you know, get your get your eggnog, right? This is the time to do it, right? Get your eggnog, and and we'll get started here. Um, so I'm really really excited to have uh, Dr. Uh, Sandra Thomas here. She is, you know, amazing when you look at what she's accomplishing down in in Chile. And uh, you know, there's a picture of the Rubin Observatory there, but but she's really been been part of this for the start of that construction, which is I think seven eight years running now. Um, and through all that time, she's been a project scientist as well. Um, she got her PhD actually in 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 France. I'm not going to try to pronounce the school, but it's basically the uh, uh, engineering college for optics uh, in in Paris. And so she's now like a lead, the lead in adaptive optics and, and planetary uh, science uh, uh, for this observatory, as well as being the deputy director for the construction phase, which hopefully is, uh, we'll get an update here, but uh, hopefully is gonna be finished soon and uh, we'll see amazing discoveries um, uh, from that. Equally impressive, uh, she's a ballerina, uh, a rock climber, and a mother of two, and I think that's probably the toughest job, but maybe the most rewarding too. Um, not sure, but um, that's amazing to balance to balance all of that, uh, uh, Sandra. And so, uh, hopefully, you're you're on, and you can. I'll stop sharing here, and we can press with your presentation. And again, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. And thank you very much for all this introduction. Uh, I am a mother of two, which is why I'm in my office right now <laughs> at home, <laughs> I'm trying to balance that one. Um, yeah, so I will share my screen, I guess. Um, I have it open twice, so let's try that one. Let's on that one. It's this one. All right, we should be able to see it now. Hey. Yep, looks good. And uh, and you can click the slideshow maybe. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank you both for the introduction. Uh, there's uh, a, uh, a couple of corrections, but most of the the introduction is right. I have been on the project for about eight years now, uh, and I started as a telescope and site scientist. And a couple of years ago now, I uh, started as a DPD director for the construction part of the production activity. Uh, my background is in optics and most instrumentation for astronomy. And yes, I'm also very excited to present the goals and status of the Vera Series of Observatory as you're entering the last phase of construction and you're building momentum to, uh, for the excitement of this um, unique telescope to come along. All right, so if I can, I will start with the short uh, two minute video. If it doesn't work, please uh, call to someone, let me know, and we'll just get to uh, the presentation. But I wanted to start with that because it really uh, gives you an idea of what I'm presenting in the presentation. And, and I really like that uh, introduction to Ruben. And so this is something that you can also share with uh, your family and friends to, to explain what the Ruben Observatory will be. So let's see if that works. Let's try it again and see if it works. That looks good. Can you hear it? I, I don't hear anything. No, I see it. All right. So let, let's move on. Um, I will post the link to the uh, to the chat. And uh, again, this is an amazing video. Really looking at um, how the we're we're looking at the sky and how modern technology will really allow us to uh, open up a lot more. Of the astronomy, but that's really what I'm going to present in a, in a presentation. So sorry about that. So in the video, uh, we one of the mission of the observatory is to really produce an unprecedented astronomical data set to look at the deep and dynamic universe. And then one aspect that I really want to emphasize is we want to make the data widely accessible to diverse community of scientists but also engage the public to explore the universe with us. So the whole infrastructure and the whole observatory, as we will see, is really uh, built to allow for the sharing of uh, images and data along the way. So what is it really? Uh, what, why is the Veracity with an observatory special? It is an 8.4 meter telescope after all, and we have a few already around the world. Uh, we have Gemini, North and South. Uh, we have the VLT, uh, the Very Large Telescope, built by the European. So, you know, it is a big telescope. It is one of the biggest we have, but it's yet another one. So why is it so special? Uh, one aspect is that it has a huge field of view. Uh, it's built on five degrees, which is about seven moons. It is really, really fast. We are planning to observe the entire southern sky in 3.5 nights on average, so three to four nights. And as I alluded to it, it's going to uh, deliver a huge data product that is widely uh, available, which is very different from some of what a lot of the telescopes are doing. Uh, even JWST, Hubble, you actually, as an astronomer, uh, ask for time on the telescope and then depending on uh, your interest with, and, and how well rated it is, it's going to point in one direction to observe your particular target. But Vera Suburban, similar to Gaia, which is also a space mission in that effort, uh, is doing a survey. So it's a survey of the sky, and then uh, the product is not the telescope, or the observance of the telescope, it is the actual data product. So that's a very different uh, way to look at um, astronomy um, with women. So in the a, in a, uh, next 40 minutes of our, I'm going to talk about why we are building the various urban observatory, what it is, so how is it built, and then uh, what's the status of the construction. And I will spend a few slides uh, on the citizen science that you can do uh, with ribbon although we still, we, we need the data to build even more that, that pipeline. 
Okay, so the very few urban observatory would produce the LSST survey. You might have heard the word, the word LSST in the past, and that was the name of the observatory. It was a large synoptic survey telescope. We renamed uh, the observatory, and but we kept the acronym for the actual survey, so the actual data product, uh, the legacy survey of space and time. And what is that? It's a digital and color movie of the universe, literally. So as you, as I said, we're going to take an image every three to four nights of the southern sky for 10 years. So we'll have about a thousand visits per field. We'll have about 800 to 1,000 images per field combining six different filters. Um, the filters, I put the names, but I also put the wavelength. We're going to go from 350 nanometer to about 1100 nanometer. So we'll be able to reconstruct the evolution of the sky over the, the 10 years um, of data. And another way to look at the data is to stack all those images, which will allow us to look at objects that are uh, 27 magnitude in our band, which is about 600 nanometer. So I, I, I heard you uh, earlier, you were talking about minus four, uh, the guy is about a zero. We can see maybe about seven magnitude. So this is a lot fainter than anything we've, we've actually had uh, in the past. And the product, again, is not just images, it's a catalog. It's a catalog of uh, stars and galaxy with, ex with exquisite photometry, meaning uh, how much signal do the, the stars and the galaxy have astrometry, what are their position in the sky, and image quality. So this is a, a big endeavor. In the next few slides, I'm going to spend some time on the uh, goal. So why are we building this catalog? Why are we, we building this survey? Uh, there's four main areas that we're going to probe. Uh, the first one being dark energy and cosmology. So as I mentioned, we're going to look at uh, each piece of the sky repeatedly over 10 years. And that will allow us to, uh, to detect the different, uh, look at the evolution of the galaxy, the, the, the variation of the galaxy. We'll have 40 billion objects catalogued by the survey. We'll see galaxies we haven't seen before. Um, and then by looking at the property of the galaxies, we'll be able to understand more about the dark matter. And this was really the main reason why scientists about 20 years ago, I was not even uh, involved in this project, were uh, looking at building such a survey. Uh, the, the, the telescope was actually uh, named the Dark Energy Telescope at that point, and then it got renamed a few times. Um, so understanding and getting a lot of galaxy examples even some that we don't know yet will help us uh, um, understand it a little better. And I wanted to add these slides in it to explain why we named our telescope Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Um, Vera C. Rubin was an astronomer and she was very key in uh, discovering dark matter in galaxy. And she was very key in changing the way we're looking at uh, our universe and the evolution of our universe. So because, as I mentioned, the dark matter is, is core to the observatory mission, we uh, dedicated and we used her name to name our telescope. And then on top of that, I also wanted to mention that, especially as a woman, I'm really thankful because she really advocated for women in science and women in astronomy in particular. I've read that before her, women were not allowed to actually use a telescope. So I couldn't be here uh, if it weren't for her and others like her. The second um, goal is to look at the Milky Way and uh, look at, so not just a lot of galaxy, but look at the uh, understanding of the evolution of our own uh, galaxy. So what we're doing for that is um, because we, we uh, think that there was a local a companion galaxy that was 
merge with our own galaxy, creating what we call filaments in the sky, strings in the sky. Um, we want to use the Rubin Observatory to detect even more. They're usually very faint and um, making sure that we can actually image those streams, for example, and then uh, getting more of that will be able to understand a little better the evolution of our own, uh, own galaxy. And of course, we'll also be able to detect more objects and, and, and uh, which will increase our understanding as well. Uh, transients, again, the reason why you're, we're doing a movie is to look at the changes. And the sky is not just uh, still. Things happen, supernovae, uh, asteroids. Uh, a lot of things are moving, variable stars. So understanding, looking at the sky repeatedly over 10 years uh, really gives us an, a window on what changes. And um, one particular aspect that is very relevant for us is the the meteor the transients, the meteoroids, and um, other things. But to go back to transients, this is the way you're doing. So we have our telescope, we have images, and then we do differences. If nothing happens, nothing changes. But then when something happens, there's a difference, and that causes an alert. An interesting part of it is, so the alert is being sent to uh, other people, we call them brokers. They will look at the alerts, they will make sure that it is a real alert. So we're actually hoping we won't have too many, too many uh, false alarm, but I think at the beginning we'll have a lot. So they look at the alerts, they classify them, they come from them, uh, and then they uh, look at previous images to connect these alerts to potential uh, previous in, um, the, uh, data. And then what we'll do with them is that we send them to the world and the, the whole network of observatories to do follow up. Uh, our own observatory is, is uh, too big to have what we call adaptive optics. So it's too big to actually correct for the turbulence of the atmosphere. So if you do see something like that, that I show in the image, that needs to be seen with a better resolution, we can send that to, for example, Gemini or uh, another 8 meter that is equipped with an adaptive optics, but we we'll look at a very tiny field of view because usually it's a three arc second and not three degrees. And then finally, uh, we're looking at cataloging our solar system looking at the same sky over time will help us uh, looking, searching for potential hazardous asteroids. Also adding up images over 10 years will help us on this, discovering new objects in the sky, and in particular in a belt between Mars and Jupiter or outside in the Kuiper belt. Maybe we'll discover more planets. So this is something that is definitely uh, of interest for the science community. And looking at the asteroids, uh, we do know that uh, asteroids as small as 140 meters can be quite destructive. And in the past, there's two examples that we can, uh, we can give of asteroids that had huge impact either on Earth. Uh, so that was the Tubutska in 1908. That was an asteroid that came in the, in the atmosphere of the Earth, but creating such an explosion that had impact on the ground. And then the other one is a Shoemaker Levy, which was surrounding Jupiter and then finally crashed into its surface. Uh, you can Google it, it it's interesting to, to read. But the bottom line is uh, we will be able to detect moving objects really faint. So we'll be able to actually detect 90% of the near Earth object of larger than 140 meters, which will help a lot with uh, potential killer asteroid detections. All right, so this is, in a nutshell, uh, the goals of the Urban Observatory. These are the four main goals. We do have more opening, so we have target opportunities. So if something uh, interesting is happening, 
at a particular time, we do have uh, some windows that scientists can use. Uh, and if you do want more information on what we do with Ruben, I encourage you to find uh, the paper by our director, Ivesic, from Science Drivers to Reference Design. And uh, you can Google the, the, the title and you will find it uh, for more information. All right. Uh, what is the Veracity Ruben Observatory? So how do we build such a system that actually will enable this science? Ruben Observatory is located in, in Chile, uh, in central Chile, near a town called La Serena. It's a lovely town by the beach. Uh, so, and the facilities are a little bit inland, if you see my mouse. It is in the same site as Gemini Observatory, which is another emitter telescope. And also you might have heard of Tololo, um, Cerro Tololo, which is a which has a four meter telescope and an optical battery telescope. So it's in the same general area. The main observatory is composed of three main elements, not including the education and public outreach. It has a telescope um, called Simoni Survey Telescope. It has a huge camera, you can see and um, estimate the size of it in this picture with a very proud team. And it has a very sophisticated uh, data processing pipeline behind it that we are providing to the community. And I will go over those three parts in the next slides. We also call our observatory the, uh, the survey the white fast deep. Uh, and I will explain you on. So just wanted to make sure you had that terminology. Uh, so wide, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it is 3.5 degrees or seven moons. Um, and it's useful to have such a big field of view for time domain science. So then we can more quickly go through this sky and then increase your probability of, of finding rare events. So I, uh, Sudan Nova, for example, um, get up in quite quick. So we want to catch them as they go. Um, I did put in green in each of the next two slides, the challenges that it actually brings to our telescope and observatory designs. Um, I, I go quick, if you have questions, we can take them at the end. Um, but having a big field of view, as you can imagine, since you're doing using um, telescopes, it actually is challenging for the optical design. So making uh, an optical design that is robust enough to miss alignment and has a good image quality over the full field of view was quite tricky. Uh, it requires a large camera, which means um, building the lenses and building the camera are quite challenging as well. And it needs a very accurate astrometric and photometric calibration, remember, uh, understanding the signal and understanding the position. So we actually know that any variation comes from the objects itself and not our system. So there's a lot of thought that has been, have been put into uh, making sure of that, both on the hardware side and also on the pipeline um, side. It is white, so again, to get a sharp image is challenging. So the way we have it is to use a three mirror optical design. So we have a 8.4 meter primary mirror. We have a 3.4 meter secondary mirror and a five meter tertiary mirror before we actually send the light to our camera. Um, one little and I, and I tried to show you where it was on the actual telescope. So this is our, maybe the first um, picture in this presentation of the actual telescope, it is real. Um, the bottom here is our primary and tertiary mirror. And then the secondary mirror is behind uh, this gray structure, which is a baffle to diminish the amount of light going into, because that light that's going into our system. So we're calling it the M1 M3 because 
it is made of one single substrate. So it's one single piece of glass that was then polished differently on the outside and the inside to give the two different curvature. So that's why it's called M1 and M3 primary ear. And this is really a unique design and that was allowing us to now have to align the M1 and M3 in addition to the M2 every time uh, we were actually moving the telescope. So that was, that was doable and very convenient. And then we have a higher quality optics then. Uh, so a little bit more into how we make the images sharp. So it's, uh, we are using active optics systems, not adaptive optics. So the adaptive optics really is planned to correct for the turbulence, but it is not possible to correct over that big on the field of view because each of the um, each of the rays that are coming coming from the different part of the field of view will go through different patches of turbulence. So we can't do adaptive optics, but we do active optics. And the active optics is a um, way to correct for any dis deformation of the mirrors as the mirror moves across the sky. So you can see that if a mirror, a telescope moves in elevation, so moves in, in pointing, the, the mirror will not see the same gravity and it will def deform and that creates uh, a, a worse image um, quality. So we did use active optics on both of the mirrors, M1, M3, and M2. And you see uh, a picture on the bottom right of the actual glass mirror with a lot of little gray uh, points, which are the connection to the actuators. And uh, you don't see much on the bottom, but there's like a, a blue part, which is the cell, which is the superstructure that you could see in that picture right here. That was uh, a picture done in Tucson here at the Neo Lab, where we did the first integration and testing before both were sent separately to Chile. And right now we don't have the mirror on the telescope, as you can see, it's just the support system with a, a piece of metal to do a bunch of the testing. And then the, on the top left is the M2 mirror. It's the same thing. We have actuators in the back to control for the deformation. And then finally, the pictures on the bottom left is what we call the hexapod. And this is to allow us to realign the two mirrors and the camera with respect to each other. Again, as we're moving in elevation and the, the telescope itself might sag a little bit, we're realigning all that using these exapods. All right, so we have 156 activators on the M1 and M3 and 72 activators on the M2. I hope I was clear. <laughs> and so we'll go back to white fast deep. So the fast, we need a fast telescope. We need something that moves very quickly. Again, 3.5, uh, uh, looking at the whole scale in about four nights. We need that rapid cadence for um, short-lived events, uh, like supernova explosions that I mentioned earlier. We also want to look at constraining uh, the um, properties of asteroids, and we also want to be able to detect microlensing, like for instance. So this is really important. And uh, but what does that mean? It means that in in three um, in four nights we need to move 3.5 degrees on the sky. We integrate for 30 seconds, so twice 15 seconds, and the telescope itself has to be in, in observing the sky in five seconds. So that means that we need to move from one position to the other in five seconds, and that includes the motion and the settling, so how fast it can not move anymore and be able to take sharp images. And that's quite challenging. Um, we're doing a lot of tests right now. And it's actually, uh, we're, we're almost there with that at seven seconds, but the goal is really five seconds. So we need that very stout, very short 
telescope mount, we need that mount to be uh, stable very quickly. We need these active optic systems, so the actuators behind the mirrors, to be also very stable very quickly. We need a stable environment, meaning inside the dome. We don't want um, vibration, we don't want turbulence. And then the last point, um, uh, uh, interesting. So we need a crawling dome. What does that mean? The, the telescope will move quickly and the dome doesn't move quickly. So the, 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 dome will be the, the dome will be smart and we know where the telescope will, will, will go next. And so during the exposure, it will follow and it will anticipate the telescope and get in position ahead of it. And that's why um, we call it a crawling dome. Uh, the, and then the last point is it's an automatic scheduler, which is the brain of the observatory really. We do have a sophisticated software that takes into account uh, the clouds, takes into account potential satellites, planes, um, laser guy stars coming from other telescopes, uh, um, status of the survey, and with all those information, he would know and he would tell the telescope where to go. Um, that picture shows uh, a snapshot of the survey, and that's to get to the next. And I hope you see that. Yes. Uh, so that is a simulation of where the telescope, where the scheduler, the brain of the observatory, we tell this telescope where to go. Uh, so it doesn't look like this linear field position uh, that I showed you earlier when I presented the dark matter slides. It is a little bit more chaotic than that, but it's, a, it's an organized chaos. <laughs> so again, it takes the, the scheduler takes into account the survey um, status, clouds and, and et cetera, to really get the best position with the goal of the 10-year survey completeness. And so you see, it means that sometimes it's a little bit higher or lower in elevation, changes filter. So the colors, if you see them, are different filters. So it does that all automatically. Um, so the one on the left is just for a few hours, and the one on the right is showing the cumulative status of the visit with the goal of getting about an 800 visits per, per position per second. Okay, so I went through white uh, fast and now we add dip. What we call dip is faint. So the saying that we're able to see dip means that we're able to see very faint objects. And we need that for, uh, remember, discovering potential new galaxies to give us some indication of dark matter. We need that for uh, new Earth objects, transients. Uh, so this is a requirement that leads us to need a magnitude limit of 27.5 integrated over the 10 years. And you can see that on the graphs. Uh, the, the two pictures here show two different surveys. The left one is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is also uh, a survey to, uh, with similar uh, objectives, but it, is, it doesn't have the depth of the LSST, as you can see. On the right one, you see a lot more objects than on the left. And the, the graphs on the right shows uh, different surveys or different uh, telescopes on the graph of the, the field of view and then the magnitude. And you can see the, the trends. So the, most of the telescopes uh, or instruments either have to have a big field of view or a faint magnitude. Um, you cannot get both. But one of the practicality of the ribbon is that you will get uh, both the field of view and the magnitude. It is challenging 
because you need to have really good throughput. So your mirrors have to conserve all the photons, all the light that is coming into the telescope and then ensure that it goes all goes to the detector. It requires good image quality, uh, lots of constraints on the active optic system and the optics, good calibration, and the detectors have to have very, very low noise and very high quantum efficiency. Um, so that was mostly for uh, for the white fast dip. Is that difficult? It seems like it a little bit, and it's not over. So in this slide, I show some of the challenges that uh, the data management and the team responsible for the post-processing had to go through as well. So this is an image uh, taken by SDSS, and this is a simulation of what we will get with that SST. It looks great. It looks, we see a lot more stuff. But that also means that um, it gets complicated because the combination of depth barrier and throughput makes it uniquely challenging. You have a lot more blended. If you look at one particular object, it's on top of other objects. So in order to isolate the flux or the position of that particular object, you need to de-blend it, that what we call. You need to isolate it from the surrounding uh, objects. One other aspect is latency. We have to get those um, reduction very quickly if you want to do alert production, right? So you have to go through the post-processing very quickly. We need to give those alerts that I mentioned earlier in 60 seconds, and they need to be pure. So we need to make sure that there's, they don't have false alerts as much. Uh, I'm sure we have them, but we want to decrease the amount of that. So we want the images to be really clean so then it produces bright alerts. And we might be uh, systematic limited. So we might have um, signature from the system, from the telescope, coming in as an error and not coming in as a uh, real source coming from the stars or the objects that we're looking at. So again, the data management group, DM, has been really trying hard to meet all those goals. And they've been using uh, precursor data like a hyper-supreme hyper uh, camera, which is another survey on Subaru, uh, to actually test some of those um, post-processing pipelines. The, um, in order to get, so I mentioned the systematics here, so really understanding our, our telescope to be able to take out any signatures that are in our um, images is important. And I won't go to the technical really details of this slide. What I wanted to uh, give with that slide was that we have a complex calibration system. We have a way to, for instance, look at the atmosphere calibration. So look at the throughput of the atmosphere because we do want to understand, again, our photometry and astrometry very clearly and very accurately. And for that, we have this auxiliary telescope. Uh, you see on this picture, the Rubin telescope, and then this 1.2 meter telescope shown in the picture too. So that telescope will get, will get spectra of the atmosphere at different wavelengths, and then the produce calibration product to be used with the data to ensure that we understand what is the contribution of the atmosphere in terms of photometry. And then we also have the normal in-dome calibration, which are uh, usually flat fields. So you can see on, I hope you see my cursor, but on the, uh, the right top picture, you see that white screen and this is to allow us to, to do flat field to look at a uniform piece of cardboard so then we understand if we see non-uniformity in our image it comes from our system and not from from the star or the galaxy or the object and um in the mission we said we wanted to make the data widely accessible to the to our a, a diverse community of scientists. So once uh, we have our data, we have images, they're well understood, 
the data management have done a good, um, a good job with cleaning the images to produce the, the data products. Uh, and this is done through the, the communication of all the products and images is done through what we call the Rubenstein's platform. And it has different options. It is a large database of not only the images and the, and the data product, but also of tools, notebooks, codes that allow the astronomers to um, analyze the data that they, they're getting. And you can see an example of what a, such a tool would look like, but this is a little bit in the gritty details of, of the presentations. Um, and this, I'm going to go quickly because I, I mentioned most of them. That was to give you an idea or summary of the type of data product that we're going to have um, between the alerts, which is the 60 second uh, alerts that we're going to get uh, sent to the brokers, and the data releases that we're going to get every year. So we have 11 data releases, which is uh, the buildup of the catalog of the galaxies and stars that we have. And then finally, we have uh, put in place the data product that you can use as a user and then really access the images and then get your own um, classification of stars or um, maps or anything you might be interested in doing with the images and not necessarily with the, the catalog. So we have about 10% of our computing resources uh, at a different data center located around the world um, to do that. Okay, um, hope I have a little bit more time. This should go quicker. Um, this is really a few videos on the status because I do think that videos, you're not on site, but it's better than just still pictures. So this time it should work because there's no sound. So that first one is about, uh, we used a drone to fly around the, the telescope itself. So you see the massive dome with the, the opening. So what you're facing at my right, right now is a shutter that would open side to side inside the dome. And the, the, the width of the dome of that shutter is 10 meter, which is just barely bigger than the um, mirror, which is what we need that floating dome that I was mentioning. The flaps that you see, you see some open here, they're called louvers, and they are, um, we can control them to change the flow of the air to make sure that the environment inside the dome is quiet and not turbulent. Uh, this is very important to that for our image quality, and also the, to, to make sure we have a constant temperature. And that little lift that you see um, as you fly by is an elevator that allows us to bring any component that needs to be maintained to the lower part of the observatory um, and then work on them. So that's from the, in the outside. And then from the inside, this is an old video from last exactly a year ago. So it has doesn't have all the components that we have. It's a little choppy, so I will send you the link. I was afraid of that. That video will show you, shows you how fast it goes. This is not accelerated. It is a little sharp, choppy, but the, the speed of it is actually real. And it really gives you the idea of um, that slew that I mentioned earlier, that how fast it goes from one position in the sky to another. And uh, soon there's going to be another video on the YouTube Google website that shows you how quickly it stops and it stabilizes. Um, but uh, you see, it's pretty compact. Um, so anyway, I will send those videos around. Um, but you can go on YouTube you now, there, Google Observatory, and you'll see that as well. So the status of the telescope is. Um, as of today, we have almost everything on it. We have uh, all the, 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 the mount, we have 
um, most of our um, mirror systems except for the glass. So we have no glass. Um, and what we're doing right now, actually, as we speak, is to really move that telescope around to make sure that it actually behaves the way we were expecting. We're doing a lot of performance tests before we put the actual mirror on. We don't want the mirrors to break. Um, so we want, to we want to understand forces of the actuators, correction as we move uh, um, in gravity, speed, uh, precision, robustness, safety. So we're doing a lot of putting in the system and out so then we, we're sure we're not going to drop anything or break anything. So that's really, really an important phase. And then uh, one thing that I want to mention here is that this camera that you see in front of the telescope is what we call our commissioning camera. And our commissioning camera is a smaller version of the main big camera that you see the picture of. And this is a, allowing us to do testing on sky before the main camera is ready. So it is also installed on the telescope at this point. Um, so very quickly, we have a, a very sophisticated coding chamber which allows us to put that reflective material on top of our mirror to allow for uh, that depth that I mentioned earlier. And this is really, I wanted to show a bunch of cool pictures. This, I, I had to scale that picture down, but this massive thing is 12 meter across because it has to be able to take that eight meter um, um, primary mirror. So this is massive. Uh, it barely fits through the tunnel, one of the tunnels that we have between the main town in Asena and our observatory. Um, so we were really monitoring that process very carefully. Our secondary mirror is coded and it gives us better than expected uh, reflectivity. And our M1 and 3 is going to be coded in the next month, actually, as soon as we're done with the test and we're taking the status of the primary to figure off we are going to um to code m1 and 3 and the two pictures on the bottom are not star wars pictures they're actually uh the, the the hardware that we are using and to actually code the mirrors and the colors are the different substrate that we're using to to put the different ladies that allow you to get to that great um that we're talking about The status of the LSST camera. So I want to spend a second on this picture. It shows you how big this camera is. Uh, each of the little squares are one 4,000 by 4,000 uh, pixel detectors, um, CCDs. And we have 189 detectors in this camera. The commissioning camera that I talked to you just a couple of slides ago, is only nine CCD, so it's only that central part of, uh, of the uh, LSST camera. Just to give you another way to look at it, uh, it ha it's about 1500 HDTV, and our director uh, had fun with photo montage to put all the 189 CCDs on the, uh, on the big building to to show how big this thing is if you had to display the images on the uh, on the legends TV. And another way to look at it is it would take about 11 months to go through all the images that we're taking for uh, during the 10 years survey. So this is really the greatest movie of all time. Uh, it has 3.2 gigapixel per image, and this is a nice image of uh, various children that the team took when they used the picture and then they uh, displayed it on the, on the CCD. So right now it is still uh, being, it is integrated. So that, that's just another picture to show you the scale. But it is integrated. It is at uh, Stanford, at Slack in California. And uh, these two pictures show, again, different views of the camera 
uh, with a very proud team in the Kenya. We are going on, we are going through uh, performance characterization before we actually we actually ship it to Chile, and that includes going through some of the different the, the similar uh, in dome calibration that we are going to have in Chile, the flat field that I mentioned, darks, biases, uh, those are images of such things that we're getting in the lab. And we've collected a lot of data in the last year to be able to test it. And all these images are actually sent to our uh, US data facility, so the data center that will collect all of the images and that uh, will be enabled astronomers to connect to. And so we're already also testing how efficiently we can do that process of testing, of sending the images to the, the data facilities and using our pipeline to, uh, to reduce them. So we are in good tra trajectory to ship the camera in March uh, 2024, so in, in, in a few months only. And I mentioned a lot of data facilities. Uh, this is the globe, and this is, uh, and I, I, I just said we just send it to the US data facility, but this is not easy to do. This is where the, the telescope is down in La Serena. And this is Tucson. And actually, this is an old picture, but the data facility is right here. And so the Pixels have to go through all those lines to get to the data facility to then be um, um, processed to create the alert. So remember, 60 seconds. So we have 60 seconds to do all that, to send the images, reduce them, and then send them to um, the conquerors that will do the alerts. There's also another site in France and another site in uh, Great Britain as well, and in lesser markers. Uh, those are pictures of the different data facility. You need a lot of computing power. You need a lot of computers. Uh, we also do have some contract with Google right now for commissioning to allow us to get the rest of the facility in place. So there's a lot of uh, hardware also behind the pipeline that is required for uh, analyzing such a lot of data. And then the bottom pictures are our control rooms. We have a few, uh, one in Tucson, one in La Serena, and one at the summit uh, of the observatory, of course. This is an example of images that we actually took with the auxiliary telescope. Uh, and that shows some of the capability of one CCD. So they did a, um, different patches of the sky and then looked at, at the data pipeline to get ready for the amount of data that we're going to have. So this is just one CCD, not 189, but it gives us some reassurance that our pipeline is going to give us clean images uh, with the actual SST camera. All right, so with that, the observatory is ready for the last phases of commissioning. So what does that mean? Uh, so right now we're on the left. We have in ounce, we have optics on, um, sorry. We have the structures, the, the mirror supports on the telescope, and we're ready in January 24 to start the process of putting the actual mirror on the telescope. We also are expecting the camera in April. And while we are using, uh, verifying that the camera still works after shipping, we are going to use our commissioning camera, a smaller version, in, a, in July and August to do some preliminary tests and to look at the sky for the first time. Uh, then in January 2024, we will have our system for set. What we call system first time is getting images with the LSST cam that are um, of good enough quality to um, to be public. And so that's gonna happen in January 2025. And the LSST, the actual survey will start mid FY25, so around uh January timeframe of 2025. You can 
follow the timeline on this link. Uh, it has, we're updating it every month, so it evolves. Uh, but at this point, we're pretty confident that we're going to stay or very close to this timeline. Okay, uh, what time is it? I'm a little late, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's okay, keep going, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a few, a few more slides, so citizen science. Again, our mission is really to, to give as much data, data as possible to a large community, right? Uh, and I wanted to give that slide here to really show the different ways we actually build that inclusive urban ecosystem. We really want to make sure we engage a diverse group of people. Uh, so we have a very multinational team. Um, we, as I mentioned, we have Chile, we have the United States, of course, France, Great Britain. We also engage a lot of the different countries to help us with commissioning and with uh, data reduction in exchange for data rights. And so we are now involving people in Asia, Europe, uh, South Africa, uh, Africa to help us in, uh, in uh, getting ready for the data. We also have data previews. So those are simulations that we're providing to engage the scientific community to also get ready to for this flow of data that will come in 2025. And in that way, we actually try to re reach out individually to underserved institutions to also allow them to get uh, to get ready. Our EPO, Education and Public Outreach team, is very focused on accessibility of all their products. And of course, citizen science is another way to, to engage um, the larger public. So the, the two, uh, there's a lot of aspects that the, our EPO program is working on. Uh, the first one, again, is accessibility. We have a uh, website, it's quite new, Urban Observatory. Uh, it is a lot more accessible from any devices, as we understand that the world is evolving with what we use to connect to the internet. It is both translated in English and Spanish, and it has a lot of great material, including the science um, goals that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, or animated videos about Ruben Observatory, about Veracy Ruben, uh, about um, lots of little aspects of the observatory, and it, they are both in English and Spanish as well. We also have a, a formal education program and it is quite um, thorough in the sense that they really worked with educators, they understood the curriculum, and they really looked at how to help teachers in the classroom uh, to investigate any aspect of science, of astronomy. And those will actually use real data from uh, LSST, and they, they have already prepared notebooks, uh, codes, to allow the teachers to present uh, different ways to analyze the data in order to get the different type of science that we have. So this is quite complex. It's quite, uh, as I say, uh, complete and thorough. And uh, yeah, um, I, I even sometimes go in and get lost and then look at uh, what they're doing to learn a little bit more uh, about them. They also have great pictures, so I will let you enjoy on your own time. So I encourage you to connect to the website. They, we're also doing a lot of science releases. We're doing them monthly now, as we're getting really close to the end game, to the um, beginning, well, I would say to the end of construction, beginning of the LSST survey. And so there's a lot of really good material uh, that is being put together by uh, our science, uh, EPO scientist. And finally, uh, we will work on the Sky Viewer and an Orbit Viewer, uh, which are two apps. And uh, we have our citizen science. We also engage in a lot of social media if you're interested. All right, last two slides. Uh, I don't have a lot, a lot 
to show because again we do need data um, but the goal is really to facilitate uh, the project development by um, it, uh, principal investigator and um, so then everyone can do science and we're partnered with the Zooniverse. We, um, the EPO team has been working on notebooks in within the Ruben Science platform that I mentioned to really enable to connect directly with the Zooniverse uh, uh, site. There's a lot of communication between the two, a lot of uh, planning. We're also putting in place a team, uh, CITSI or Citizen Science team, to really support the the citizen science to uh, to have successful projects. Um, all right, and that's it for this one. The the notebooks again will be able to use real data, and uh, it will ensure there's communication between the universe and the RSP. Um, the the RSP being the Ruben Science Platform. So they're doing a lot of that right now. They're developing different notebooks, so different codes. What we call notebooks is because they're Jupyter notebooks in Python. And uh, we're doing a lot of examples, like a basic one or a more, more complex one to look at time series and also look at early uh, workers. So um, if you want to know more, if you're interested, uh, we have our EPO scientist, Claire Hings, who will be very happy to uh, to help anyone look at any demo that she has on, on that. And also, um, we welcome your, your input. So we want to make sure that uh, you can explore the real science project and contribute to astronomy and astrophysics today. Uh, this is the different types of um, astronomy that Claire has looked at and is planning to uh, to get input from. And so if you want to contact her again, her email address is in this slide. And there's also an interest form that you can fill in if you, if you want to. There's a little bit more on our website, but not much more at this point. Okay, so the various urban observatory is becoming real. It is not just a set of designs and drawings, it's actually now real hardware. Um, that was, again, an idea that started in 1999 and construction started in 2014. And so we're 10 years in almost. And yeah, it's uh, very nice and exciting to, to get to that point and um, see it becoming real. And this is really my last slide. I'm going to leave you. I didn't want to put it earlier in a, in a talk because I didn't want everyone to play on the on their cell phone. But this is an interesting game that our EPO program put together uh, where you have to play the scheduler. You, have, you get to be the brain of the Ruben Observatory survey. And so you have to tell the telescope where to point in the sky in, in order to get the most object. But you also have to avoid planes, satellites, clouds and you have a certain amount of time before the sun rises so uh, i leave it there and you'll have that presentation anyway so you can share that with uh with your kids or friends uh, this is a fun game i think i got to about 40. i was not very good at it that is super uh, cool yeah thank you sandra and uh, this is awesome um yeah i thought you might have the high score there but no <laughs> no, I think that's a little better. But <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Awesome job and a and a really exciting project. Um, um, I'm really intrigued by the alerts myself. I'm I'm just wondering what drove the what drove the 60 second requirement. It seems like it seems like that would go out and then it would sit at some other observatory while they set up, or can they react to it in a way that like makes it a real value tip. Oops, sorry. Uh -uh. I'm sure. Okay. Um, so the the sixty second, um, the 
we do want to get, and, and this is something that we're actually working on with different telescope, but we really want to make sure that there is the process for um, those other observatories to get ready. So the 60 second is not to take a follow-up image. The 60 second is really to uh, to get back, so, because after that you have to go through the brokers, so you have to go through that sorting. So, so you still need more time, and then you need to alert the other observatories. So, um, the the sixty seconds was really to understand, and and it was twice the thirty seconds that we have as an exposure. Uh, so it was really a, a constraint. So then we can actually alert the, the rest of the of the, uh, the scientists. Um, at first, we had a little more. Actually, we had 90 seconds. Are those uh, those alerts going just to the other observatories in that complex that in Chile there, or do they? No, it should go like the brokers. Uh, are, so the the one of them is here in Tucson, uh, on Terrace, and no, they're actually uh, accessible to to everyone. It's it's world public. Huh. So everyone can actually get the alerts. They can not necessarily get images, um, but they can get the alerts. So we ha we're right now talking uh, about like how do we use those alerts? To the, the, is that a push or is that a pull, right? Uh, so we're, we're trying to get organized in that, in that, in that space. Okay. But you could get the alerts and then point your telescope. <laughs> yeah, I was curious, and I might have missed it in your citizen science project there. If like amateurs are have ac accessibility to the alerts, or I mean, is there any like likely yeah. we could contribute in any way? Just but by random luck, we we see something that was a tip off or something. Yeah. So the the alerts are oh, it's the images that are not. So the images you, we need um, more time, and they they only completely open to people who have access to the RSP to the Rubin Science Platform. So that's a little bit more limited. But the alerts themselves, no, they're actually open. Oh. Nice. I think we have a few questions. I know John, uh, JB, do you want to start down? You've got several questions. I know, <laughs> but. Uh... Yeah, you can ask them or, or just, uh, you're on, John, right? Or deep, okay. muted? Can you hear me? Kind of soft. Uh, I had a, several questions, and I don't have them all in front of me on the chat. But uh, one of them was, uh, you talked about the settle time that it took between something or other, pauses right. of focus. Uh, does that mean that all the light that you collect during the slew, during the travel, gets thrown away? So the the shutter of the camera will be closed at that point. So um, maybe I went a little too fast on that bow. So we are starting, the telescope is in position. We are opening the shutter. We're taking 15 second, two, two times 15 second exposure. Then we close the shutter and then we go to the next position. And during that, and that's what I call slew and settle. It's the motion of the telescope to get to the next field. And during that time, the, the, there was a shutter in the camera, and that's closed, so you don't get any data. Right, sure. I thought I was hoping there was maybe yeah. some way of processing the transient data to reduce it uh, and extrapolate photons, you know, that are on intermediate uh, cells and things like that uh, while it's moving, and integrate that mm. into the, the captures. But uh, apparently not yet. Anyway. No, and and you would have too much motion. I think, yeah. So, and during the exposure, we're tracking, right? We have a tracking, of course, um, pointing model that helps us track the sky. Um, so when you move, you don't have that because it's okay. not the same speed. Yeah, no, that, that answers my question. Um, mm -hmm. The other was, uh, you said that there were several uh, DM processing facilities around the world. Uh, do they operate in parallel for confirmation or reliability or do they operate on a sort of timeshare so they can share the loads of the huge amount yeah. of data you're sending out. It's Which mostly way. the timeshare, yeah. It's mostly to, to, to share the loads. So we, um, I mean, right now it's not, it, it's one, two in Europe and one in the US and then one in Chile. 
So depending on where you are, you can access one or the other, and that helps with um, that load of connections and data transfer. I mean, the data, there's no data transfer because you're actually working on uh, the data at the facility, but there's the data computing. So if the whole world is connected to the one in uh, California, for example, you have less computing power than if you're sharing the load between different sites. Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other was uh, the citizen science part of it. Uh, I used to participate in something called Boink, the Berkeley Online uh, Internet, uh, yeah. basically computer processing sharing. Uh, is that part of your citizen science program, or is it exclusively through the uh, Zooniverse? Um, it is exclusively through our, the Zooniverse, but I can definitely mention that to uh, to our EPO scientists. Yeah. It, just, well, it, it, it was doing a lot of SETI processing for many years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I can, I, can, uh, I can definitely mention that to her and, and see. Um, I don't know if it would provide useful processing given what you're what the kind of imagery mm -hmm. you're trying to process, but you've got a lot of data, I guess. To there's a lot of data. <laughs> hey, thanks, John. Um, Ian, you had a question? Yeah, so it, I don't know much about artificial intelligence, but this certainly seems like a field that would be very ripe for leveraging some of that capability. Is that something that's being used in your program? So it's um, being thought of, not necessarily used at this point. Points, but we're definitely thinking about putting uh, AI or machine learning in some of the aspects of uh, the data pipeline. But also, uh, one thing that I didn't have time to mention and go too much into detail, but we are actually using uh, wavefront sensors. So we are using detectors uh, at the periphery of the camera to do real time um, optical quality estimation. And for that particular aspect, we are definitely uh, looking at other options such as machine learning. So uh, in short, we are looking into it, but we are not right now applying. Uh, but yes, that's something what we're like, looking into. Thank you. It's getting very popular. We actually even, it's, it's um, a little bit tangential, but we're even looking at using, uh, using it for maintenance. So looking at, you know, predictive maintenance, which is looking at data to anticipate any failure in the system, we are actually looking at if we can use AI for that. Hey, Sandra, a question on the engineering that's like, uh, I'm not an optics guy, but it seems like when you take the combination of the optics complexity and then the slew rate that this thing has to do and then the just the mass that it's moving and all the adaptive optics. Uh, have we built like a uh, like a smaller version of this whole thing, like a prototype that we kind of know is gonna work end to end, or are we really kind of exploring the, the edges of all these different features uh, only when it's built up? Right, so there has been, we didn't build a smaller version of it, but we did have inputs from other telescopes. So the mirror that we're using is the same as the the the, um, the Magellan right telescope, and they have actuators. So we're using that experience. Uh, the secondary mirror was the same as the Sol. Uh, the Sol telescope is a four meter telescope um, on the same Cerro Pachon on the same cliff next to Gemini, and it has an active optic system that we actually also uh, had experience with. In terms of uh, survey and analysis, we have, there was a, this survey that I mentioned, the DES, which is a dark energy survey, which is done in Chile as well at Cerro Tololo, and we took some of their uh, inputs. So no to your question, but yes, as an idea of, yes, we did definitely took some of existing uh, technology to put together this one. Okay. But well, there's still some unknown. We'll still, but yeah. it's, <laughs> I mean, I just, I'll tell you more next year. <laughs> yeah. Even the data, data management seems, uh, you know, on the, 
not risky so much, but it's it's the timelines and the amount of uh, you know um, just collaboration from different data centers and all that stuff seems like it's a it's a complicated complicated program. Uh, John, it, another it question. Is, but it, yeah. Oh, uh, just on the data management, it is, but it it had that's the easiest in the sense that uh, we are using the auxiliary telescope for that particular alert timing so we're actually already now testing the pro the um, the pipeline to get to that 60 second it's not scale of course but we also do a lot of simulation we have the data challenges where we simulate the full survey uh, and then get it through the pipeline to be able to exercise and get get ready for the data so yes we it is challenging and i'm sure we'll discover issues with the real system, but we're really trying to push uh, to get to get ready for it. Cool. Sorry. Nice. Um, uh, yeah, John, you had another question? Sure. The, uh, the first question I had, which I had forgotten about, but uh, when you're talking about uh, 10 years of stacking, uh, does that information have some sort of envelope with with respect to the way that the spectra and Doppler effects are included in the stacking, I can see how stacking can uh, allow you to see something much fainter than you would otherwise, of course, more photons. But uh, each of those photons reflects uh, Doppler and spectral information that isn't redundant from one one frame in the stack to the next. How does that work? Um, that's uh, the limit of my data management knowledge. Um, the the thing is, you you also get all the individual images. So you, but this is something that they, they took into account. I don't know how. Uh, I have to admit, I don't know how they took that into account. If that's a good thing for magic. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, hey, thanks, John. Uh, hey, Paul, did you want to uh, ask your question? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mayor, very much for your presentation. Just curious if quantum computing algorithms are useful in analyzing the huge imaging data arrays that are being collected, and if so, what would you be looking for using these types of algorithms? Um, that's another question that is a little too on the edge of my knowledge. Um, we, yeah, I, I don't know if if like how it would be useful uh, really i mean it, it, i'm sure it is useful but we we haven't i haven't really talked to the data manager manager to do to do that i'm kind of looking down the chat box anybody else here we're kind of running running a little late and i apologize but um good discussion and and great brief so don't want to miss anybody if there's other questions um, but if you uh, if you can, uh, so Paul and John, if you want to send me your emails, I can definitely answer those questions that you have uh, after I talk to some of the my co my colleagues. Um, I'm sure okay. they thought of it. It's just that I didn't get that information. <laughs> well, we don't want to give you action items either out of this. That wasn't the point. Well, but it's it's interesting. Yeah, you know, no problem. Um, we'll follow your website. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. I did have one. So no one else has questions. Um, last call. I did have one more for you. I wanted to kind of, I wanted to find out what a typical day is like for you because you balance being a scientist on the one hand, but then you're the, you know, you're doing construction management on, on the other and you're balancing lots of things between two different countries, maybe more. Uh, you're in Tucson now. What's a day like for you? In Tucson or in Chile? <laughs> well, just what's, what's the next year look like for you as you kind of roll this out? So, so the next year will be a lot of travel to Chile. So, I, I, my, as you said uh, in the present in the introduction, my background is in adaptive optics and active optics. So, that's going to be my main technical task to align the telescope and get it to and get the image quality. Um, that we need to get uh, so there's going to be quite a bit of travel and 
So that's the technical aspect, but really on the management side, what I care about is, of course, to deliver on time and on scale and and uh, on budget. But it's also to make sure that the people are keep excited, keep being excited. People are not working. Um, they're working a lot because they're excited, but not too much to actually get completely exhausted. So there's a really fine balance to find and to uh, to take care of the people and also yeah. to take care of the system. So that's, yeah. I think in a nutshell, that's what a, a typical day for me is, is really to balance the technical aspect with the people and with the, the schedule. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. You're, you're doing a fantastic job. It's an exciting year ahead, I'm sure, for you and uh, the rest of us to yeah. see kind of the results. Uh, and I think, John, you had one more question about funding. Some of the funding is from like DOE and the National mm -hmm. Science Foundation. What, are are there any stresses in the funding profile, or do we do we have a good uh, roadmap ahead and have have the funding secured for? For all this, yeah. So, so the 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 camera is mostly the DOE, and it, they are now in operation. So they 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 are putting the commissioning aspect and the integration in operation. So they're already on a path towards uh, towards that that funding. For the NSF side, we do have uh, a couple more years, and we are in very close discussion with. Our, our um, delegate at the NSF, we have a very good relationship so that the funding is definitely uh, secure for the next um, two years. Um, and, and we do want to finish that telescope. And then it's it's still the NSF that will cover operation. So we're, we will really, the observatory itself will uh, continue if uh, that is uh, the underlying question. We do have the funding to make it work and to start the LSST um, survey. Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Sandra. And we held you longer. Oh, thank than you. You. Now you can go home and <laughs> have dinner or whatnot. But thank, <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for the extra time and the briefing. Uh, uh, truly amazing work. I, I'm, I'm impressed with the engineering more than maybe the science piece, but that's just background. But so I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. super excited for you and the team there uh, going forward. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Well, okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Not, well, you're always website. welcome to come back. A year from now would be another good brief we could re we could get with you, right? So, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, thank you very thank, much. Yeah, thank you. All right, so no vacers. A lot of good outreach coming up this weekend. We need your help. Uh, Friday would be a good one. Even Saturday at uh, Crockett or, or Udvarhazi on Sunday. So. And then we'll get into a nice quiet period uh, for the holidays and we'll, we'll kick off the new year uh, with even better stuff. So um, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a good night.